Hey everyone, Unbox is a bi-monthly event series where guests are asked questions in an AMA-style format, focusing on questions relevant to early-stage startups and blockchain technology. Unbox is sponsored by DLab, a startup accelerator and venture studio that sits within the SOSV family. You can find out more at www.dlab.vc. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, Jack and Ron, it's a pleasure to have you guys on. Um, it would be great to start off if you guys should just introduce yourselves to the, uh, to the uh, crew here. Jack, okay. you want to start? Sorry, no, Mark, you, can, you don't want to start? <laughs> All right, I'll start. I'll start. Um, my name is Jack Tater. Um, I'm pleased to be here with Paul and the SOSV gang and, and the D-Lab guys. Um, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. We've uh, been involved with uh, D-Lab for a while. Uh, know the guys there. It's a great team. Great bunch of guys. Uh, I guess, uh, as you can see, Ron and I, or at least I, I'm not a spring chicken. Um, so uh, I've been about um, three decades in financial services, involved in crypto. Um, I've written extensively on the topic, and I'm currently writing for Forbes on it. And uh, we also run um, uh, a couple of uh, venture funds, and which I guess we'll get into uh, in a minute. And uh, I'll send it over to my business partner, Ron, who is also a uh, old friend, and uh, we met in college, and that goes back that goes back a while. So I'll let Ron introduce himself. Uh, Ron Kostrin, uh, Jack and I are both managing directors of Doyle Capital. Um, let's see. Uh, previously, I was a CEO of a Fortune 1000 company, and probably about eight nine years ago, Jack started writing about Bitcoin and started talking about it, and we got involved back then. I'm a little late to, later to the game than Jack was, um, but we, you know we've been investing together probably about at least seven eight years now. Oh, that's great. Yep, long time. So long time. So we've been through this space for a while. Yep. And so, um, does Doyle Capital just make investments in crypto companies, or does it make investments in in companies in other industries? Uh, uh, well, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Uh, other, other industry. We, we started off being, and this goes back to some of your other questions. We started off, uh, you know, investing in Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and then you know got involved in some of the uh, the ICOs when they were hot. And um, we we had our our aha moment uh, when you know we were involved with a couple of uh, you know I ICOs and things like that, and you know, giving, you know, young 20 somethings, 10, 20 million dollars after, you know, writing a white paper in the, you know, the parents' basement. Um, and just then just throwing 20 million dollars at them, we realized that this thing wasn't gonna work, right? You know, you know, all of a sudden there's, you know, Lambos in their parking lot and we're like, they don't know what they're doing. Their projects will not get finished or completed. People are gonna lose money. So we sort of, uh, transitioned over to more of an advisory service and, and, and mentoring of uh, young startups and uh, putting some time in with them, doing some seed investing and sort of trying to help them actually become real companies. When, when RK says the aha moment there, it's, it, 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 was, uh, it was at an interesting time. Um, we were basically making, um, making money without even doing anything, and this was really at the boom of the, uh, at the uh, which 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 made us suspect that something was wrong when when it was a little too easy to make money. You could have picked any ICO, close your eyes and just threw it at any ICO, and you were making four or five times your money on these things. And that that for us was a signal that that something was amiss. And then when we started to recognize that the people with these projects were just getting them with white papers and no business acumen at all. That was when we recognized that uh, it was time to really pull back on what our beliefs are, which is that we're only going to put money into something um, that has a good business, I, has a good mm -hmm. business plan to it. And uh, I mean, we invest in people. I mean, we'll talk about that as well, but it has to have a good business idea. And, and it was at the point where we had made an investment um, into a company and we sat with the, um, with the people running the company. And we said to them, don't do your ICO. 
do not do the ICO. And we explained to them why they shouldn't do the ICO. We made a very lucid case for why not doing the ICO. And they basically were at the point where they were like, we're too far along. Because at that time, and I don't know if people remember this, but during the ICO run, there was like a ICO factory that was out there that basically you could get in, people would take care of your white paper, people would take care of your publicity, and you will push this ICO through, and you'll be a millionaire, and who cares about uh, your business idea and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. So we basically said to these guys, do not do your ICO, and they were too far along, and that company is now bought. Yeah, no, we saw we saw applicants even to D Lab where it was just um, companies designed to make it easy to ICO your company, and we saw applicants, and we probably I think we still do to this day. It seems a little toned up now, but we had we, um, we had yeah we had people that would come to us at events, and they would say, "Oh, let us tell you about your I- uh, our ICO," and and RK and I were always like, "No, no, no, tell us about your business." And yeah. if they could tell us about their business, we would carry on the conversation. But if they were like, no, 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 look, our ICO plan is this. We're going to do this, 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 and this. And we would just basically say, no interest. And and it was at the point where we were just hearing too many of the, I, the ICO stories and not enough of the business ideas. Although that being said, those people during that period who came to us and said, we're going to tell you about our business, have been some of the best investments we've made, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because we really redirected them to focus on your business. Yeah, so what's thank you tokens, right? You know, oh, we're going to issue tokens. Okay, why? Right? Well, yeah. we're going to issue tokens that way we'll get money. It's like, okay, well, does your business actually have a use case where you need tokens? It's like, eh, no. no. We we ask the same questions ourselves on our end, um, and you know, it's um, it's more complicated than people think because you have to think about what I always you have to think about the economics about like the token, you know, the supply and demand and how that works and how you issue, do you burn them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you, you know, you, you, these things don't operate in a vacuum and there's human beings involved. So there's like the psychological um, behavior of human beings and we all behave irrationally. So even if you have this perfect model, it's got a bonding curve and all these things, maybe it doesn't behave, you know, maybe people don't behave the way you expect them to. And that's like really, really hard to, to factor in. Uh, right. The, but the question always is, is why a token versus Bitcoin or, or fiat, right? Yeah. Is, it, is there a yeah. real reason for it, right? Yeah. They, no, it's like, you know, and one of our points has always been, you know, when you're going to a token versus fiat, right, you're losing 90% of your market. Right? You're yeah. Losing your market because people are just, I don't want to deal with, you know, with tokens or crypto. Yeah. You have a business model that's built on fiat, right? may make us some money. So what is your, um, your thesis generally when you're looking at blockchain companies? Um, you mentioned you're very early stage, so you're looking primarily pre-seed, seed stage companies, but what other characteristics or industries or whatever it may be? Well, we're, we're, yeah, we're most, we're most comfortable, and I think this is because of our personalities and our background, and, and we've had successes as early stage investors even before uh, getting involved in crypto. Uh, but we like to get involved at a, a pre-seed stage. Um, which gets a little tough for us being being older now because uh, there's a longer time frame when you're in a pre-seed uh, investment. But um, we like to work with with early early stage business leaders, um, you know, who tend to be maybe some younger people with a great idea, great passion, great energy, great talent, great smarts, and they just really need to be uh, provided some business sense and uh, some realities about you know where how they take a great idea and execute on that. And, um, and we have met some amazing individuals because of that. And I think that's where we feel most comfortable. There are enough investment, um, uh, what we call investment partners or people in our uh, kind of uh, world, our network, who will then do the round A and the round B and we pass them over to us. And, and in fact, we have a number, we have a lot of uh, those firms who are, constantly coming to us and saying who else do you have who else you know who else are you working with because by the time we hand them off we've molded them into into business people and uh, uh and that also you know that's good for us i mean ron is a ron tends to be the ceo early stage ceo for these businesses uh and and developing them into uh finance people 
Um, I try and I try and take um, take the view of um, strategic planning with them, organizational types of things, and those types of things. But right now, our our main thesis is we uh, we are focused on what we call transformative technologies, which is really technologies that are out there that we feel are um, going to transform the existing working space that's out there. Blockchain is obviously one of them. Uh, we're involved in things like distributed computing. Um, 3D printing is a big area uh, involved. And what's funny is a lot of the projects that have come to us in this space um, had some thoughts or some ideas about doing something with a token. And then when we really re-examined it and brought them back to the business concept, a number of them have dropped the token idea, a number of them have um, are holding off on the token idea until it's very clearly a utility type of token. But um, that's kind of where we feel most comfortable. RK, same, your end? Uh, I, that, that's exactly right. And I, I think we're sort of agnostic on blockchain versus o other uh, things. Like I say, we're, we're looking for transformative or disruptive technologies. And what we view are, you know, look, we're, I like to say we're at the age where we don't have to work with people that we don't want to work with. So we look for, you know, young founders that have good ideas. Um, and we help them, you know, uh, define, you know, some, you know, uh, define their business plan, their uh, pitch decks, uh, you know, try to get them up to, you know, to do some funding to try to get them up to MVP. But what we really try to do is to mentor the CEO, CFO, COO suite, right? So that when money, so they're all ready for Series A. They know how to manage funds. They know how to budget and forecast. And they know how, when they do get money in the door, how to actually run a organization going from three people to 30 people to 300 people. So as Jack said, we, we get a lot of calls from, you know, some, some of the bigger VCs out there saying, hey, can you go spend some time with these guys and, you know, make sure they know what they're doing. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And before, like, because I have some questions, because there's a lot of founders um, listening in. Um, but um, by the way, if anyone in the crowd has any questions, just feel free to dump them in the Q&A, and I'd be happy to ask them um, towards the end of the call. But um, before we go down there, I wanted to ask, so like, what projects do you find? You spoke about your aha moment in terms of investing in, in cryptocurrencies or blockchain technology. But what was your sort of aha moment in terms of like, oh, blockchain technology might actually be something um, and it's not just like pixie dust. Well, I, I, I would have to say that for me, that that came along when I first um, learned about Bitcoin. And, and I'll give you a little bit of, of, of history there. I was running a market research firm and we were working with financial service companies. And, and part of the charge that they had for us was to try and identify what are those um, technologies or uh, advancements that are happening that are going to impact the financial service industry. So back in 2012, 2013, you know, Bitcoin was was at a very early stage, and um, my firm um, was was looking at Bitcoin for our clients. And I said to an associate, I said, "Look, do me a favor, you know, write, give me a couple of pages on Bitcoin." He proceeded to come back and give me about a 60-page report on it. Uh, we modified that, and we actually published it as the first book ever written about Bitcoin called What's the Deal with Bitcoin um, at the time. But in looking at that, I started to understand what's going on with the blockchain. And, and what was most interesting for me from the blockchain was the immutability, the, um, the transparency of it, and the fact that there's no central authority. Um, those are all compelling, compelling items for a um, for concept. Uh, you know, we're starting, you know, and, but it also made me recognize that this isn't something that's going to happen overnight, unless it's just Bitcoin. But, but trying to throw things into a blockchain technology is not going to be easy. And in fact, Ron and I, have, we've discussed a lot about the whole private versus public blockchain. And I was a big proponent of um, that, you know, there really isn't private blockchains out there. That it needs to be open. But we've seen companies that are implementing blockchain technology uh, in such a way that they're benefiting large companies and things along those lines. And I, and I do think this is going to be a process that's going to help out supply chains, financial systems, and everything else um, down the road. Um, it, whether it's going to be revolutionary, 
uh, transformative. I mean, it runs into a lot of the a lot of the powers that be out there. So you've got to basically not just say we've got this great system and it's going to take over the world and the world is changing and blah 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 blah. It has to have a business component to it. And uh, I think we're starting to see more and more of those businesses uh, now coming along. Great. Um, what projects do you guys find like super interesting today? Or what projects do you think are a little, or areas you think are extremely overhyped? I can leave the overhyped to RK. RK is, RK is very cynical and uh, skeptical on a, lot of the, on a lot of the technology. So I'll let him kind of um, identify some of the, uh, some of the ones that, we're, that we tend to think are overhyped because unfortunately, there are a lot of them out there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I'll bring it to two things. Right? One is, you know, what we like, like Jack said, is transformative or disruptive technologies, which basically means, you know, um, that David's going after the Goliaths in a more, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian way where people can share in it. Uh, we talk, one of our favorite things is uh, distributed computing just be, for multiple reasons to go against the, the Amazon and others of the world, right? I mean, you know, there is a lot of compute power out there in terms of laptops, phones, and the like. And, you know, I just don't think there's a need to build data centers anymore. And you had a more of a, you know, green effect by utilizing even old laptops and the like that you can, you know, uh, you know just run, you know, uh, calculations on and things like that and get paid for doing it. Something like that is uh, a great, you know, a great model that that we like. Um, something that is, you know, sort of brings it to the masses. Um, the things I think are well. So one of the, the big areas that I don't like, I don't like um, people developing applications and platforms that say once once people own Bitcoin and crypto, then they will use this. Right, we like projects that you know will lead make people adopt crypto or things like that, and not necessarily even know that they're doing it. Distributed computing is a great thing. And think about, it. you know, they may be using tokens to to do the accounting on the distributed uh, compute platforms, but they probably settle in fiat or Bitcoin or something like that. Um, so, well, which but projects that I like are things that drive to adoption of crypto and the like. I don't like things that are built just for people that are already in the space. So as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of DeFi for DeFi sake, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I like the idea that, you know, people can earn interest on, on crypto and things like that. I would like to see, you know, I, I keep telling some DeFi people I know is, you know, why don't you pay interest in dollars? Or let's or give people the option of taking, you know, half what I earn in, in crypto and half what I earn in dollars. So people actually get a more of a sense that, oh, it's sort of like normal banking. Right. Mm. So things yeah. like that. No, I mean, I, you know, it's, um, you know, DeFi, I think it's, you know, coming from a finance background, I think DeFi is fascinating because, you know, when I worked at a bank and someone wanted to get a, a margin account, right, they needed to have like a million dollars and then they needed to sign paperwork and it needed to get approval and it took a while. But uh, with UIDX, like, you know, I'm assuming you know how to get crypto, buy crypto, own it, all that stuff. But once you know all those things and you get on a platform like DYDX or any of these platforms, you can do margin trading with one dollar and it takes two minutes and it's like beautiful to see. But the question is, uh, you know, the user base is insanely it's tiny. And, yeah, and when will and when will it get to critical mass? You know, and, and, that's, and it's a question and, we ask ourselves. Yeah, and is getting one hundred or five hundred x margin really serving anybody's real purpose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For manipulating markets. And yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but with the last ten minutes, since there are a lot of founders, and I know you guys oh. interact with a lot of early stage founders. Um, what like I, I wanted to drill down a little bit more specifically on like like, like what are some common pitfalls that you see? when founders come to you and ask for advice or, you know, ask for money, you know, we tell our founders always ask for advice and then you'll potentially get some money. But if you ask for money, you'll just get advice. But what are some common pitfalls that you see that um, founders should be aware of that 
you know, from your perspective. Uh, well, go ahead, Arthur. Well, this, the major one that I, I always find is that people want to take over the world and before they take over their neighborhood, right? And yep. it, it's, it's great to have a focus and a, you know, and a roadmap for world domination, but it's not going to happen overnight and you need to take the necessary steps, like I say, you know, you know own, your, own your street, own your neighborhood, own your state, and then take over the world. Yep. No, that's that's fantastic advice, and I agree completely. Um, you know, sure, you want to be the next decentralized Uber or whatever it is, right? But it's like you can't take them on right now. You gotta. What are you gonna do in the next six months? Um, you know, twelve months, and then sure, yeah. But um, yeah, we we uh, we also. I mean, we we try to one of our uh, one of our tenants is basically that we we work with uh, founders who we believe in to try and have them keep as much equity in their business as they can. So one of the things that, that potentially um, founders do is they end up uh, partnering with somebody or doing this or doing that and, and they end up giving up a lot of their, their equity. Um, for us, if you have a great idea and you're a great founder, then you should be able to keep as much equity as possible. So we work with them and there are creative ways out there to raise money without having to give up equity. So those are things that those are things that your advisor should be helping you to do. Uh, and when you choose an advisor, when you work with an advisor, uh, make sure they've been through the process before. Uh, make sure they're not just in it for a land grab, um, because I've seen I've seen too many businesses where they slap, you know, twenty advisors onto their their website. And they think that's going to benefit them. Um, what you really have to do is you have to have advisors who are going to kind of teach you the the rules of the road. And, and work with you. I think that's one thing that's one thing that's great about D Live is because you guys have done this stuff. You've been there before. You have connections with people um, who have backstories, who have history and have and have been early stage and you've worked with them to try and keep as much of their equity as possible. And then the other thing I think that every founder has to have is patience. Um, we see a lot of a lot of projects who don't when they get involved in something, they're like, oh I got this great idea and I'm gonna be a millionaire in two or three years. And this takes patience. And, and also, if you're not cut out for being patient, you may not be cut out for being a founder. Uh, you may end up getting out of it early. They may not be, uh, uh, you know, RK and I, I, I you know, the story I've been involved with a company from back in the Princeton area, um, and it's now going on 18 years uh, with this company. And this company is a great company. This company is making major inroads and hasn't given a dime back to its investors. But the, uh, the vision of the founder was to really change things in more of a green manner. And so that person is proceeding along to accomplish what they want to accomplish. It may not be making the investors happy, but investors invest in projects not just for money, but they also want to have to believe in the project as well. So yeah. there's, there's those things you have to look out for when you, uh, when you bring an investor on board. Yeah, yeah I, not. I mean, an advisor on board. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, yeah I just want to add a couple of things to what Jack said. I mean, um, talking about founder equity and stuff like that. Look, you start with 100% equity and you only go down, right? So you have to, and you can only give it away once. So you have to be really careful about that. Um, Jack and I have a, uh, a very interesting business model that everybody that we deal with loves except for our wives. Um, and that's, look, we, you know, when we, we work with people that we want to work with. And even with, you know, uh, with startups, especially stuff like that, when we start working with them, we don't ask for equity. We, we feel that we, just like they have to, the startups need to show us their value, we have to show them their cause, right? And we may work with companies three months, six months. We have a deal, one of your D-Lab companies that we're working with for two years now. And they actually offered us equity, you know, a couple of months ago. And we said, eh, we're not quite sure yet whether we want it, right? And, you know, we're not sure about your business model and things like that. And you know, it's key to, to, you know, we work with people because we want to. We like their idea. We like the, them themselves. And I would say, you know, the money will, you know, if, if you're committed to the project, we're committed to you. We'll work something out down the road when there's, some, when there's something in the company to actually have value to talk about. 
Yeah. What are some common things that um, founders should know about investors um, that they that is often that is often overlooked or that they misunderstand? Well, a lot of time invest. Most of the time, investors don't necessarily have the same timeline and and time frame that you do, right? I mean, if you have a a project that's going to take five years, they may be trying to you know get it over you know in the next you know quarter and stuff like that. Um, the hardest thing for startups is founders uh, is is funding, and VC funding is not the right place for them. If you if you're going to you know to a fund that's you know a hundred million or a billion dollar fund, right? They're not going to invest fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, maybe even a million dollars in you because it's not going to move their needle, right? It's not going to add two percent to their profitability in a year, and then it because of that, it's not worth their time, energy, and resources giving it to you, right? So. A lot of startups is, you know, you need to do either angel investing, friends and families, you know, uh, you can find some people to go out and raise money privately for you. And it's, it's, it's baby steps that you really need to get to a place. I mean, I'll say 98% of the VCs we know, your pre-revenue, they don't even talk to you. And the other, and the other, thing, that you, the other thing that you need to look for for an investor is, is a strategic partner. Somebody who's going to provide value to you. Um, so you can go. So many we we find so many companies are so focused on. Oh, I work with this VC and I work with that VC and I now have this valuation and they get so focused on valuation. And the reality is they're not getting anything from those VCs and VCs like that are basically counting on one of ten working. So you want to work with somebody who's going to provide some strategic. Um, uh, incentives to you, some 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 things that you need for your business out there, not just because they're associated with this firm or that firm, uh, but how can they help you to grow the business? And 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 throwing big checks at you may not be the best thing that you need at an early at, at certain points in your um, in your career in your uh, life cycle. So those are yeah. things that you have to be cognizant. Uh, yeah, and and ultimately, what a lot of people don't realize is that that valuation is really just paper number um in and you know it doesn't really mean anything until you get a liquidity event either for the investor or even for the founder themselves because um you know you can't really sure it might be worth a five five million dollar company ten million dollar company et cetera, et cetera. but nothing's realized um it's all just paper gains <laughs> right, yeah. And, yeah the money's going into the company how much money you got a ten million dollar company yeah how much yeah. how much are you getting out of it yeah, exactly. Um, and there and there are cases left and right about companies where um, you know they they achieved a valuation, but no one ever got anything out of it because um, there was just no liquidity event. Um, but I'd like to end, and then there's a bunch of questions in the Q and A about what, as investors or, or advisors, what do you love to see out of um, startups, out of the startups themselves, out of the founders? What are, what are the types of things like? I, what I love to see is I love to see monthly emails that they're sending out to interested parties and investors, being like, "Hey, we did this, we did that. Uh, we're looking for help here. We're struggling here. Any advice would be great." And those monthly touch points are great. That's like one example. But I don't know if you guys have others. Um, no, I mean, look, we, we, we are, as, as I say, you know, investors, but we also try to be partners and, and mentors. And a lot of things that we do are sweat equity, just like any other employee of the company, right? And mm -hmm. you know, we, we like, look, I, I look at it again, with, especially with CEOs of, of small companies and once they start growing, you know, there's CEOs need people to talk to, to work out problems with. And, you know, not all those problems you should be sharing. If, if you're nervous about, you know, gee, I don't know how we're going to get, you know, funding past our six month road, you know, uh, runway and stuff like that. It's, you don't really talk to that through your troops, right? You need somebody to, to talk to to actually, okay, sit down and figure out plans. What, what options do we have and things like that. And it's, it's more of a, you know, a give and take and sort of a, you know, mentor uh, type of relationships that we enjoy. I think I think I think it evolves over time. I mean, I think it is a I think it is something where, depending on the relationship, uh, it's something where it's maybe it's done weekly or whatever. 
but it also evolves into things where, I mean, Ron and I have projects where, where we are on the phone with them just about every day. And, and, and at night we'll get phone calls because of some, you know, something that happened or, or some advice or, or just being there for the person. So it, it evolves, it evolves over time. But um, I mean, I think a key thing that needs to be said here is uh, we, we work on projects that we, um, we A, believe in the people, and B, we believe in the business. Right. And then we recognize the time commitments that are there. But right now, we're involved, we're involved pretty extensively with some businesses that are ready to basically really take off. And some of them really need a lot of hand-holding. Some of them don't need a lot of hand-holding. So this is not something where we kind of come in and you're going to say, um, you know, well, all right, we'll pay you guys this to help us get up strong. We we're at the stage where we we're only working with people that we that we like that we that um, we believe in them, we believe in the business, and they're willing to listen to us. I mean, we've had situations where we've provided advice to people, and they basically think they know better, um, and they don't take our advice, and basically, you know, we we just move on to something else. I mean, so. Uh, so it evolves over time, your relationship. But I do think uh, on a regular, on a weekly basis is a good touch point. Uh, and, and, also, and also it's a good way to gauge. I mean, sometimes, sometimes the companies may, may, may say, oh, we don't need to check in with you this week. Well, that's a little bit of a red flag for us. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we want to know what's going on. We want to know what you guys are doing. We want to be able to help you. And then some businesses are like, you guys are doing what you need to do. Go ahead, come back to us when you need help. Yeah. When you're talking to a company, do you like to see things like they have a data room or like, you know, they're like, hey, we have all these files where you can go check. Just go ahead, take a look or, um, you know, anything else that you're like, oh, wow, these are they're like, you know, seemingly organized and all those things that when you're initially talking to a company that are positive. Well, they, no. better, they better have a good cap table. They better, they better be able to produce their cap table. I don't care if it's three guys on it. But if yeah. I say to you, show me your cap table and they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Come on, please. Yeah. You know, so that's a that's a basic thing. RK is the numbers guy. I'm you know I'm more the people person, but yeah. um, we we can see through numbers. I mean, there's nobody yeah. better than RK looking through numbers and seeing the fiction that's in numbers yeah. uh, to find the realities behind them. Well, so, particularly uh, for early stage blockchain companies, you know, it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah You're guessing there. Plans yeah. are going to change anyway, right? No, you know. In truth, I don't really care about documentation and, and the like. Yes, you need to have a good cap table, right? Mm. You know, you, you need to know, hey, what are you trying to do? How long is it going to take you? What's your runway? What do you need type of deal, right? And, and, and why are you doing this, right? And, you know, like I say, you know, we do a startup. Startups, I don't expect startups to have full financials and, and have yep. – you know, a few corp, you know, full corporate documentation and stuff like that. You know, otherwise they don't need us, right? You know, I have we like founders that are passionate about what they're doing, right? But are also willing. Uh, as Jack says, you know, we, we don't need. To, we're not going to tell you what to do, right? I mean, you're the CEO. What I want to do is just when I was CEO, right? I want to make sure when when you have when you're going to do something. Have you explored all the options? Or are you just charging, you know, into the breach, right? You know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? What happens if you do A and B happen? Have you, have you considered C, D, and E? And if you said, yes, I've done that, or no, let's explore that. And then once, you know, once we've, we've talked through the stuff and you say, I want to do B, God bless you. I invested okay. in you, you know? Go do it. One sense. last one, one last thing at this point. One thing that that companies should have um, is competitive intelligence, a knowledge yeah. of what the competition looks like. If we run into a situation where we we're talking to a business and we're like, um, "What's the competition do?" and they give us, uh, you know, I want them to know everything about the competitors, how they're different. Um, is there a different uh, marketplace that they're hitting? If they don't know the competition, if they're not aware of the competitive landscape, that's 
that's a red flag to us that basically they're not ready to start moving forward. That's yeah. right. It's, I, it's, I couldn't, it's, yeah. It's a war, right? You need to know yeah. your enemy and have a battle plan, right? Yeah. No, I, I actually, uh, for me as well, that's actually a big, I get really frustrated and we see applicants to deal up all the time mm -hmm. where we, we have a question on competitors and then we talk to them on the phone, like, who are your competitors? And it's like, oh, we have no competitors. And it's like bullshit, honestly. Um, it's just lazy because there are competitors out there. Um, you just have to look. And, and right, right. They, they, I, they I totally agree that that competition analysis is super helpful. Um, but let's move into the Q&A because um, if you have any questions, just dump them in there and I'm, I'd be happy to answer them. The first question is, can a seed funded startup actually afford your services, assuming you're not providing them free of charge? No, no, you can't afford us. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I mean we, we don't, you know, you, you don't write us a check. You don't write us a check. I mean, the, the only people that write us a check are our are, are, are VCs who want us to do due diligence. Um, we, we work with partners such as D-Lab, who um, who we provide we feel we provide value to they provide value to us and we can come in there and and uh, uh, and help out and to our case point this is probably why our wives don't like our uh, business plan because um, you know we're at the stage where where the time that we have we want to dedicate it to businesses that we really think uh, can be afford. <laughs> here's what I say about how can you afford us right okay so here's here's our business model send us a pitch deck. If we like it, first call is free, right? And the first call, at least the first call is free, right? To discuss, okay, what's your business model? What's your target? You know, what are you trying to do? And the truth, how much of a dick are you, right? Yeah, no, yeah, that's <laughs> fair. Whether or not we want to work with you. And then, you know what? And then we'll have a, second, a second call, maybe a third call, right? And say, okay, you know, are we, you know, are we providing value to you? Do we see anything interesting that 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 you are doing? Do we want to be associated with this? And and we'll go from there. Like I say, we could, we work with some companies a year, two years, without anything actually being formalized. Next question is: Do you see a place for using SPACs to help businesses scale post seed and Series A, B, et cetera? Mm -hmm. I'm actually not clear what an SPAC is. So it's a special purpose uh, yeah. vehicle, like an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, SPAC is actually a special purpose acquisition company. Yeah. And you're saying, yeah. we're, going to spend, we're going to raise $100 million and deploy it into uh, AI and stuff like that. Huh. Okay. Start up. Don't ask that question. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, if, 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 there, if the question is more around uh, being more creative, uh, and it makes sense for the business being more creative with a funding model and a financing model than just straight equity, then, then potentially there may be room for that. But it has to fit the business. Um, and, and, you know, we, all, we always like uh, people kind of looking outside the box for options to, uh, to fund their business. Uh, that being said, I, you know, I, I've worked with businesses who have totally avoided the VC route and decided to go their own way. And for some of them, it worked. For many of them, uh, it it hasn't worked because, the, or or it's taken longer because they've had to learn things on their own where they could have learned things by partnering with the right VCs uh, along the way. And mm -hmm. many people will be like, I, I'm going to go do this on my own, and they can be great, and they can potentially do it, but it may take a lot longer than being involved with the right VCs. But you know, I, I'm all for thinking out of the box and trying to find other funding and financing options out there. Whether a SPAC is the right thing for them, I don't know. That depends on the business. And that depends on the competition that's out there around the business as well. Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess, you know, I had a question about, you know, do you see, you know, a lot of the time we come across and maybe founders expect that they can access capital in normal capital markets. Um, sooner than perhaps they expect so? Like, um, you know, what advice do you have there? Like in terms of, oh, you know what? If we get to a series A, then we can, I can just raise debt the traditional way, right? Um, but wanted to see your thoughts there. Well, 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 all right. Okay, I know you're gonna have a point here, but I, I, do, think that, I do think the space is evolving. And, and yep. I do think, and I do think with DeFi and some other things out there, 
that yes, there may be some options to do it. But when you talk about the traditional funding and going public and all of those things, that's not happening. But there are some other ways. I mean, that red reg A deals, you've got some things that are brought out from the Jobs Act, all of those things. It it is a little different of a of a landscape out there. Uh, but you've got to be very careful there. Um, but RK, what do you I mean, what's your point on you on that? It's like I say, you know, two years ago VCs were throwing money at anything that had blockchain and in, in their name. Um, now, in truth, anything that's free revenue really isn't going to get funded by VCs. You need angels, you know, angel networks or, uh, or, or small business funding, depending upon what you're doing, right? I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kid, you know, if you're actually making a product, you know, uh, or, or something interesting, you can actually do Kickstarters for, you know, for future products and stuff like that. You know, there's, I think there's the, the, um, the market out there for individual investors, like I say, either through Kickstarters or, you know, Bank for the Future or, or things like that, that can provide some liquidity. Um, the next question I had uh, was, do you consider automated governance an infrastructural technology? There you go, RK. RK's favorite topic. <laughs> RK loves governance. Governance is going to, we're going to, I mean, it's, 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 it's hot right now. You know, you got, uh, um, what is it? DX DAO or what, what, what is it called? I'm losing my mind, but just did, uh, anyway, that this is the hot topic. DAOs are the hottest topic. And that's how, that's how companies are kind of, you know, the reason for creating a token now is, oh, we're going to have a DAO and we need a token to govern that DAO. Um, I would, would like to get your thoughts because my thoughts are like, uh, but, you know, it's a way for the founders to, in, you know, get a liquidity event, essentially. Um, my two cents, but. Governance, governance, governance. Um, yeah. I, I find governance very hard because, um, you know, just because somebody has a stack of tokens doesn't mean they're involved in the platform. Right. And you've got holders, you've got users, you've got a whole bunch of different constituents under governance. Right. The only governance that I care about is that there isn't an entity that is controlling the decisions of the, the economics and things like that. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. And you look at, but the issue that I have is that if you're trying to be open and free and decentralized and trying to have a governance model, you should state quite clearly, like kind of like how publicly traded companies need to state who's their major shareholders. They should state who's the major, like, you know, for Maker, I have no idea who the major token holders are and who governs that. My suspicion is that there's a bunch of VC firms and Maker itself. But and it's not it's not truly open and free if I don't understand who's to your point the controlling parties. No, and I think you're that right. should and be a standard. What, what happens at the end of the day in a capitalist society is yeah. that the value of your governance is reflected in the value of your token. Right? If it's mm -hmm. if if you're operating the way you're supposed to operating, regardless of the of the governance model and the governance voting and, and the like, it will be reflected in the price. Yeah. Otherwise it won't. Right. If no, there's I, somebody controlling it, then then the hell with it. Yeah. No, it's it's but this goes to like how there's no um, regulation in the space and so no one's required to publish who the major holders are, but it's something that should be we should we should adopt in the crypto space if we're truly serious about, you know, equal access to data, equal access to information, all these things. But, yes, yes, but I'm not, but I'm also not a fan of mob rules either. So yeah, no, of course, of course. But um, you know, and I, I have no problem with you know a VC or even the foundation itself owning a large share of the tokens. I just like to know, you know, right. what's going on. Yeah. And it's it's insanely opaque, and you have to guess by looking at wallet addresses and just guessing. Anyway. No, 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 no. Look, look, and and, and I look just like in, you know, in, in the equity markets and the like, right? I believe that founders, VCs, anybody with large positions, right, should only have non-blackout windows and and things like that when they can sell, right? You don't want, you know, somebody, you know announcing, you know, oh, we have a new contract with so-and-so, well, they're dumping tokens on the open market, right? Mm -hmm. you, need trans 
you need transparency. Yeah. You need, you know, some sort of, if, if you're going to sell tokens, if, if the founders are going to sell, then put out a schedule that says, I'm going to sell, you know, a yeah. million dollars of tokens every quarter on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we went down a rabbit hole, but I totally agree. And plus transparency, it, and I think transparency and accountability are like on the same level. If you have transparency, you're holding people accountable to doing the right thing and not doing the right thing. You know, if we're a DAO, right, we're trying to be, uh, you're trying to govern something that's fair to everybody in, in a sense. And you want to make sure that the people who are voting are not acting in their own best interests, but acting in the interests of everyone as a whole. But they um, won't because, because yeah. you no, know, of course. You, you know, you know in, in any sort of a governance model, that the people holding the tokens, yeah, right, the stakeholders are going to have more votes than the users. Yep. But I so we, we, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I do think it's important to for people to work on a governance model. Yes. We are yes. nowhere near and a governance model getting created that's going to work. So investing money in a governance model or saying, oh, this is a great governance model, to us is not something we would invest in. And we've seen too many too many examples of governance models where it looks great on paper, but the guy running the project, um, if he wants to piss in the pool about a project or, or something that's come up for, for a vote, that ruins everything and it's not true governance. And and let's let's face reality. I mean, the proxy model that we have with equities is not a great oh, governance model. Doesn't either. work either. So totally. I think it's yeah. great. I think it's great that we get developers working on the governance model, and there are certain VCs out there who will fund these projects for the sake of coming up with a good governance model. But from a business perspective, it's not something that we see that we see. Is, it, is there a last let, last I'll point on? Oh, sorry. Last one more. Governance models are so overrated because at the end of the day. The people that actually control the governance are the users. You don't do you don't do right by the users. They will move somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, talk about Facebook or or something like that. Out of here, users decide where to spend their money. Yeah. Um, okay, that makes sense. Is there any like DAO project or governance model framework that's currently being worked at just that you think is interesting at all that has promise? further down the line? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we, we have some of our uh, associates and some of our analysts who are looking at the space and they may have a different view than us. Um, I've, I, I, I've engaged myself with a couple of projects, a couple of larger projects that had governance models. Um, and quite honestly, I've grown very frustrated with them because um, I think they ultimately are, are become a power play for the people who developed it. Um, there's not an openness there and, and like, you know, it's the internet. So you don't yeah. know if the person on the other end is a dog or, or who they are, or what yeah. they are, or whatever. Um, so some of the worst conversations I've seen are when different votes come up and seeking comments. And if somebody who's viewed a certain way says something, all of a sudden that motivates everybody else to just putting in nasty statements and everything else. It, back to RK's point, I mean, from the business perspective, that's how governance works. You build something that's lousy and there's no more users there. There, that, that's your governance. They voted. They voted with their feet. Yep. Uh, you know, but, uh, yeah. you know, an idealistic view. I, you know, I do like some things going on with the DAO. I do agree on it. But um, it goes back to the point that RK made earlier. We like projects that are driving adoption. While there's some governance projects and some DAO projects, that are trying to drive adoption, yes, when they're going to get there and the structure of them, I think the space yeah. still has to evolve. And I, I think, and I think, I I hope that there are people who will good good developers, good business people who will get funded by VCs who are focused on that space. But that's not a place that we're really looking. Yeah, at. yeah, and it also just seems this is the last. It just you know, it also just seems that a lot of these governance tokens. Um, are just launched because the sort of founders and probably their VCs are kind of grasping at straws about how to get a liquidity event or monetize the business. 
So like, oh, we'll just launch a DAO. We'll have a token. Well, like, well right. said, Paul. There's yeah. your answer. Yeah, you exactly. Got the answer. There <laughs> yeah. <is>. Anyway, <laughs> but I, I think it's a fascinating issue, and, and I think it has potential. But yeah, agreed. Uh, I think we all agree. Um, it with it the last falls under the idealistic view of this whole space. Yeah. And we would love to create something that's democratic, something that is inclusive. That's what we should be striving for in this space. But when, when it comes to investing money from VCs, you know, they want to see some other things. Out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm waiting, um, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for a governance model that actually rewards the people that are using it, not the people that are holding tokens. Yeah, agree. That, that's taking, you know, transaction volume into account. And, yeah. And I'll weigh in. Yeah, agreed. So uh, with the last like two minutes, um, the last question we have is, can you tell us more about the distributed computing projects you've invested in? The state of the space and the state of the space from your perspective. This is coming from someone um, who's waiting for a good in-browser WASM runtime compute marketplace. Oh, interesting! In browser, I like that. In browser, like that. that's that's interesting. That is interesting. So, so no, I don't want to start naming names, but you can look for a press release today from Canada about a distributed. Uh, compute platform that's going to be uh, doing disease modeling for COVID and uh, helping to determine when to open up, uh, you know, different areas of business and schools and things like that by, again, distributed compute, uh, compute uh, you know, for, for researchers and the like. It'll be rolled out. It'll be rolled out all throughout Canada so that researchers and academics can access this uh, platform um, to basically have access to a super, supercomputer, in fact, even beyond a supercomputer power uh, that just uses distributed compute power from unused, uh, unused laptops, uh, unused desktops, um, data center power that's being unused, uh, phone service and everything else. Uh, so it, this is not, this is at a fraction of the cost of an AWS. Uh, it is using basically compute power that is being idle and being unused right now. And the structure is such that those people who are providing the power can be compensated for it, or they can donate the compute power to, um, uh, to for philanthropic and for research means. Um, but this will be rolled out throughout Canada. We think this is transformational. We think this has a lot of potential. Uh, it's basically putting the capabilities for a supercomputer uh, out there for everyone. Uh, and, and, and this actually grew out of the fact that there weren't enough supercomputer resources in Canada. And the academics were saying it's taking four or five days to get a calculation. And they looked at using distributed computing, which turned around calculations in minutes versus days. And that has now gotten to the point where it will be now rolled out throughout Canada, and and I, we, we, I mean, but the beauty of this is this is to address a need around disease tracking, around the coronavirus, uh, but additionally to put a platform out there that'll be a basis for research and uh, uh, and tracking of uh, uh, data uh, using this regular platform without having to use uh, supercomputers and pay that pay yeah. these costs associated. Yeah, and browser based only uses. It cause that you let it to go, doesn't touch your hard drive. Ah, that's great. Um, so uh, before we sign off, um, as you get in, oh, sorry, it was a, oh, so, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. There was um, lag on the internet. But um, before we sign off, I wanted to ask you guys if you guys have any questions or any way that we can be helpful, either the D-Lab or anybody in the, uh, anyone in that, that's, that's attending that's listening. Um, well, we, we, uh, we, of course, I mean, we, of course, would like to highlight the fact that VLab has great people, Paul, Nick. Uh, there's a number of great people out there. They also have um, their own um, uh, person out there uh, who we admire and adore. Um, and um, as long as you keep duty available for uh, for uh, access to us, then um, then we will always be available to VLab as as needed. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very and much. Every, every, everybody on the call is like, what the hell did he just say? So that's <laughs> <the end of> it, <laughs> right? 
But uh, no, thank you very much, Jack and Ron. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, you know, look forward to chatting again sometime soon. Um, and stay safe and stay sound. You too.